You know, first, I, I, think, I think Governor Dayton left, but I think we all owe him a tremendous debt of gratitude as Minnesotans. You know, uh, I spent a decade during the plenty years managing deficit after deficit after deficit, and then Governor Dayton got elected and he immediately in the 2011 session faced a, a $6 billion deficit. Uh, we, had, we owed schools a couple billion dollars. We had zero dollars in the state's budget reserve. And this is his last forecast uh, before the November election. So I just, uh, I think on behalf of all Minnesotans, want to offer my thanks uh, that the governor has really turned the state around during his eight years as governor. And fortunately, he's going to be able to hand off on election day at least. Uh, unless we stumble this session, he's going to be able to hand off a structurally balanced budget uh, to the next governor. So, Governor Dayton, congratulations. Thank you from all of us uh, for uh, your hard work. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about the forecast is there's been a lot of talk about the federal tax bill and what its implications on Minnesota is going to be. And I think one thing helpful for us to think about is if we do not do federal conformity, if we don't do it, and we just stay with current Minnesota law, uh, Minnesota is going to collect about an additional $500 million in new revenue over this biennium and the next. Isn't that interesting? That's about the number of the surplus uh, between for this biennium and the next. So really, this surplus was made possible by the fact that that federal tax bill is going to raise enough revenue uh, on Minnesotans to be able to uh, get us a surplus, on paper at least. So it's the, it's the repatriation of the corporate earnings uh, that are brought back, and I just want to remind everybody, 80% of that is brought back tax-free. We only tax 20% of that here in Minnesota. So for, to people who think that number is too low, just remember that 80% of it we're not going to subject to Minnesota taxes. Uh, in addition, uh, you know, the federal government helped us out when they passed the, the CHIP funding. Uh, had it not been for that, and I think if I remember right from the November forecast, that was about $180 million or something like that, that has helped, that uh, that money is now on the bottom line here in Minnesota. So uh, the federal government has helped us out some uh, with these numbers. Uh, and, you know, and, and I, uh, I still remain very cautious that, uh, we don't overcommit this session, and as it relates to priorities, I can just tell you, I think on behalf of my caucus, one of the things that we think with this kind of razor-thin surplus that we have is uh, we should honor the state's pension obligations. The Pension Commission met last night, and I believe the bill that they considered was a little north of $30 million in this biennium, but north of $120 million in the next biennium. So if you take, if you assume we're going to live up to our pension obligations, and if we don't, it's going to have an impact on the state's bond rating agencies uh, the next time we go out for a bond sale. I, I think it's fiscally prudent to uh, resolve the budget shortfalls in our state pension system. But, you know, that takes of the 313 or so in the next biennium, that's north of 100 of it uh, will be committed just by doing the pension bill by itself. So there's not room for uh, a lot more. I will say I think the job for the leaders probably got a little easier today. Uh, you know, we've all got our days on the hill, and today there's a number of days on the hill thing, and usually when people come here, their days on the hill thing, they want to advocate for more spending for what they're coming here to talk about. I think the fact that it's now pretty clear we have very little uh, revenue uh, will probably uh, take a little bit of the excitement out of some of the people coming here looking for additional funding in the, in the second year of the biennium. And... Uh, it's, and I spoke with a group uh, kind of off the budget uh, issue for just a second. I just had a group of uh, young people here from the College of St. Scholastica. And this is a remarkable state is what I told them because if you look at one of those pages in that budget forecast, it speaks to the fact that there actually are, are more people, uh, of a shortage of Minnesotans, more people uh, looking more employers want more empl new employees than we have people available for work. Now, what that means, it's going to be very hard to stimulate an economy like that. It's very hard for businesses to uh, hire new people if, they, if the people aren't available with the skill sets that they need. So I think providing additional stimulus is going to be very, very difficult in this economy. And I share some of the concern that 
The governor has about the next biennium. Uh, GDP growth has been downgraded slightly uh, uh, as a result of the federal tax bill into the next biennium. So uh, continue to urge some caution, but certainly great news for Minnesota that we've got a structurally balanced budget and, and we really owe it all to Governor Dayton's leadership. Well, I think uh, we're about to see a case where just like in uh, the area of climate change, Republicans like to deny the laws of physics and pretend it's not happening. With regard to the economic forecast, they seem to want to ignore fundamental economic principles. Economists from across the spectrum, from liberal to conservative, told uh, President Trump and Republicans in Washington, D.C. that the net effect of a very large tax bill financed by deficit spending would be inflation in the out years that would put at risk economic growth. That is what we're seeing in the numbers today. We see a short term stimulus, but over the long term, we will see inflation rise. And we can't ignore reality. We can not ignore economists, just like we can't ignore scientists. The numbers are clear. We have to be cautious with our budgeting. And so I think I, I agree with everything that uh, Senator Bach said. The governor's approach to budgeting has been vindicated in this forecast in two respects. One, it's balanced, and that's a, as a result of a lot of work. Um, and two, it, it looks out into the future and it says what's in the best interest of Minnesota over the long term, and that we have to be cautious uh, about what we do today over the long term. You know, and, and if we do have a situation where Republicans come to the microphone next and they impugn the integrity of nonpartisan economists who work for the state of Minnesota, it, it will bring us back uh, too quickly to where we were in June, where we were arguing about illusory savings that they wanted to have in the health and human services budget. Well, we just need to cut it 10% or 25%. And then you say, well, what exactly would you like to cut? Uh, well, we don't know. It's just too high. It's growing too fast. So we have to be very clear and professional and responsible with the things that we do in the state budget. So we can't, just as we can't magically cut HHS without talking about how much less care will we provide to seniors or how many less seniors will we serve, we can't say we don't believe in economic forecast that's been put together by professionals and that we're going to ignore it and budget as though this is not the actual truthful information. Any amount of conformity possible? You've done a few tax bills in your day. Can anything be done? Well, th th this made it more difficult. Uh, you know, the conformity bill, the current estimate we have from the Department of Revenue is it's going to raise taxes in Minnesota by about $459 million. That's about the same number of doing nothing. Uh, and uh, the challenge, if you're going to raise that revenue, is how do you then find the mechanism to give it back uh, so that you don't create winners and losers? And I think we probably all bipartisanly agree uh, we should minimize the impacts of, of conformity on uh, Minnesotans' tax liability. You, you normally have to be able to plug some additional money in uh, to what you raise in order to, uh, to buy, buy out the losers uh, in it. So. I, Finding that sweet spot where we can do that got more difficult because we have a little less revenue now to work with in addition to what we raise in the bill. But it can be, it can be done, but it's going to be incredibly, incredibly complex. I, I would just add, and, and my work is, is almost uh, exclusively in, uh, in tax policy, that uh, we really need to know uh, who is uh, harmed by the federal tax bill among Minnesota taxpayers. Clearly, corporations and the business community um, are benefited by the, um, by the uh, federal tax bill, and we need to look at the individual taxpayer, particularly those families in the middle and lower middle income, as um, the focus that you're going to see, I think, from a number of proposals coming from uh, the Senate tax, tax Democrats. So I think we need to just keep that in mind when we are trying to get to some sort of uh, neutrality with money raised and, and money reinvested in Minnesotans to look uh, who was harmed. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that uh, we're going to see evidence of that with uh, lower middle income and middle income 
uh, larger families. And we need to be really careful that, that, um, that they uh, survive and thrive. And we are going to uh, concentrate on that to the extent um, that we do conformity. And uh, I share with Senator Bach um, caution not only on the revenue, but on the complexity of the policy. And acting too quickly is foolhardy. And we are not going to do that. We're going to take our time. We'll work with the Republicans. We'll work with the governor to make sure that when we do conformity, um, we don't have a, uh, we, that we do it with a mentality of measure twice and only cut once. Is three months enough to do this? All depends. On? Uh, being able to work together and having good information. Senator Bach, is a one and a half billion dollar bonding bill supportable here, given all the other the other tightness and the other demands for resources? I, I, uh, that question was asked earlier of uh, the commissioner of MMB, and he indicated that there's an 800 million dollar bonding bill paid for in the forecast, and going to 1.5 uh, would increase debt service in the current biennium by about 20 million dollars. So I, I think it's I, I think it's achievable. Well, I was just going to uh, confirm what uh, was said earlier. Uh, you know, we are leaving the state uh, in very good uh, shape as we move forward for the balance of this uh, biennium. We are structurally balanced. That's the important thing. That's the message that I would hope that uh, comes out of the uh, press conferences uh, here today. Uh, we do have uh, some issues that uh, we are going to need to address uh, this session, and I think the resources probably are going to be there, but uh, the bonding bill, as Senator Bach just pointed out, uh, actually that was my question this morning, the difference between what is already forecast at $800 million and $1.5 billion, uh, the debt service would be about $20 million. Next biennium, it does jump uh, to about $100 million, but I think those numbers are uh, manageable as we move forward with a vigorous bonding bill. The thing I want to mention about the bonding bill being a priority this year is that interest rates still remain relatively low, and I don't think that's going to be in the future. We know that interest rates, in fact, are going to be going up when you listen to what uh, is coming out of the uh, federal government and uh, we uh, think, I think we should take advantage then of the uh, lower interest rates uh, as well. Uh, one thing that I wanted to comment on, because some of you know that uh, I've had quite a background in education here through the years, and uh, one thing that I hope we can take a good look at is uh, how we match, and this is primarily our two-year institutions, but uh, the job training with the demand in certain fields. Um, the, uh, Employers are, as was pointed out, uh, looking for employees in certain trades and professions. And one of the things that happens is that uh, with our tech colleges, and I'll use those as an example, you downturn in the economy, they begin to close programs. And then the upturn comes and we're not prepared to meet the demand for workers. And so uh, I hope that uh, the Minnesota State, or what I still call the Minsky system, will uh, be able to respond quickly uh, in that regard because that will help those construction projects that would be in the bonding bill and it would uh, help uh, create uh, better employment opportunities for any number of uh, people. Uh, we do have the pension issue. That was, uh, that was mentioned. That's an important one. It's an issue that I worked on uh, when we were in the majority and I chaired Ways and Means uh, with Duluth. And what became a powerful message was that how expensive those uh, pension fixes become if you don't deal with them up front. And uh, when we got the projections from the Duluth uh, plan, uh, it just showed that each biennium, it just got uh, very, very expensive. So I hope that we're able to address that up front and early so that uh, we save taxpayer dollars, if you will, uh, and protect those plans on into the future. And then there's the Minlars question, and uh, that really comes due tomorrow. So. Um, I'm not sure just how that's going to be handled, but uh, potentially uh, that could be another uh, relatively uh, important issue that we need to address this session, just to mention a few. But thank you. Just one, one, last, one, one last thing. I mean, when we're here this time next year, uh, we're going to have a new house, 
and uh, we're going to have a new governor, and uh, I think we all need to respect that. We'll, we're going to have the same Senate. We don't know exactly what the makeup will be, but uh, the same Senate. And the fact that we have $313 million in the next biennium available to spend, and we're going to spend some of that. We're going to spend some of the 329 uh, in this biennium. We're going to spend some of the 313 in the next one. But the important footnote in the forecast is inflation in the next biennium is about $1.2 billion. Now, you can argue that, well, it's not 1.2, okay, but it's not zero either. So somewhere between the 1.224 in the forecast and zero is a number that is going to be inflation in the next budget that the next legislature and the next governor are going to have to deal with. It's just not zero. So I think we all need, as we make decisions going forward, whether it's the pension bill or MINLARS or whatever things that we think we have to do, we, we all need to be cognizant of that fact that, you know, in, in uh, 2002 we took inflation out of the forecast so that we could kind of arbitrarily hide uh, the spending side. And, but it is in there as a footnote. We all need to, we don't count it, but we all, those of us that are planning on being here next year uh, need to be pretty conscious of it because uh, it's, it's, uh, it's real.